Okay, we still have a number of people joining us, but I think we're about ready to get started. Uh, I wanna welcome everyone to our webinar today on addressing sleep apnea in cardiac patients. My name is Seamus Jackson, and I will be facilitating the session today. We are honored to have a fantastic speaker with us this evening in a, in a big group, it looks like. So uh, Dr. Agarwal is the medical director for Tidal Health Sleep Disorder Centers, Seaford in Millsboro, in Delaware. Dr. Agarwal received his Bachelor's of Arts degree in neuroscience from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland, and his medical degree from Ross University School of Medicine in Port Portsmouth, Dominica. He completed his residency in family medicine at Western Michigan University School of Medicine in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and a fellowship in sleep medicine at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. He's board certified in family obesity and sleep medicine. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Family Physicians and a fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. He also serves as a member of the American College of Chest Physicians, Obesity Medical Association, and the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. Uh, one point of logistics before we get started, we are going to have a live Q&A at the close of the session, uh, but you're able to ask questions at any time. So there should be a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen for anyone that's joining on a desktop. And uh, depending what type of phone you have, it might be at the top or the bottom if you're, on a, if you're on a phone, but you can type in questions at any point and we will answer those at the end of the session. So with that, uh, I am honored to hand it over to Dr. Agarwal to get started. Thanks, Dr. Agarwal. Thank you, Seamus, for that introduction. I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight and I'm excited to be presenting this topic. With that, let's get started. So here are my disclosures. So tonight we'll be talking a little bit about central sleep apnea, the remedy system therapy, and we'll go over some clinical results. So let's talk about central sleep apnea. So this results from an intermittent neural drive to breathe. And this is due to repeated decreases or hypopneas or absence or apneas of airflow in the absence of respiratory effort during sleep. And you often see this in patients with other comorbidities such as heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and stroke. And these patients are at increased risk for central sleep apnea or CSA. You can also see it in patients with other neurological disorders such as brain tumors, multiple sclerosis, patients that are on narcotics such as methadone, and patients that live at higher altitudes. This picture, as you can see here, shows a picture uh, during a sleep study of what it looks like for patients with central sleep apnea. Um, as you can see, there's no airflow or effort, and there's oxygen levels dropping following an apnea episode. And there is a crescendo, decrescendo breathing pattern, as you can see here, which is named chain stokes respiration, which is often seen in patients with CSA and other cardiac morbidities. So let's talk about the pathophysiology of central sleep apnea. So during sleep, respiration is regulated by the brain whose goal is to maintain a constant blood carbon dioxide level. To keep these levels regulated, the brain sends signals to the diaphragm via the phrenic nerve. And these signals control your pattern of breathing. In patients with central sleep apnea, the brain develops a respiratory arrhythmia that manifests as an oscillating pattern between hyperventilation and apneas. In other words, the respiratory control center in the brain are imbalanced during sleep, and they fail to give the signal to initiate inhaling, causing the individual to miss one or more cycles of breathing. So what's the difference between obstructive sleep apnea, OSA, and central sleep apnea? Uh, we can see this in sleep studies. So on the left, we can see OSA. So you're looking at the nasal flow, effort via the abdomen and the thorax, and oxygen levels. So in OSA on the left, you can see the abdomen moves as a breath is attempted, and the airflow is blocked or reduced due to an obstruction resulting in the oxygen levels dropping. In comparison on the right, you can see central sleep apnea, the abdomen does not move, there's no breath attempted, and there's limited or no airflow due to a lack of the attempted breath, resulting in the oxygen levels dropping as well. But essentially, all lines are flat, whereas an obstructive, you can see on the left, there's still some effort. So most patients with CSA have concomitant cardiovascular conditions. On the left, there's a really good pie chart showing the ideology of central sleep apnea. 
So as you can see, 55% have heart failure, 18% have heart failure and atrial fibrillation, and 4% have atrial fibrillation. So about 27% are related to cardiac, which is pretty high. 11% are related to stroke, typically right after the stroke occurs, and 12% are idiopathic. In regards to heart failure, 70% uh, of CSA patients have heart failure and or reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Approximately 75% of heart failure patients have some form of sleep disorder breathing, whether it be obstructive or central sleep apnea. CSA occurs in 30 to 50% of patients with heart failure with reduced EF. In regards to atrial fibrillation, 20% of CSA patients have AFib, and CSA occurs in 10 to 30% of patients with atrial fibrillation. CSA confers two to three fold increase in atrial fibrillation risk, and the treatment for CSA is associated with improved atrial fibrillation outcomes. So these are pretty impressive statistics. So in heart failure, CSA can accelerate cardiac disease progression. And I like this diagram because it shows the reciprocal interaction between CSA and heart failure. So essentially, each episode of CSA and arousal results in hypoxia, elevated norepinephrine, and wide oscillations in carbon dioxide. This hypoxia can result in poor sleep quality, efficiency, cognitive uh, difficulties such as dementia. And then results in elevated norepinephrine, which causes arrhythmias and activates the renin angiotensin system, resulting in sodium retention and neurohormonal activation. It's this neurohormonal activation and ischemia that further activate the chemoreceptors and triggering central sleep apnea. This therefore results in additional heart pump stress, which leads to adverse you know, heart remodeling impairing cardiac function, and therefore causing the worsening and progression of heart failure. Sleep disorder breathing is common in heart failure. And sometimes the untreated CSA symptoms can overlap with heart failure symptoms. So it can be difficult to distinguish between the two. On the left, we have a pie chart showing the United States heart failure population. So about 2.1 million people have CSA, about 37.5%. Similarly, 2.1 million people and 37.5% have OSA, and 1.5 million people or 25% have no sleep disorder breathing. Many patients with CSA complain of symptoms which may be multifactorial. So they complain of fatigue, which may be attributed to low cardiac index, medication side effects such as beta blockers, depression, coexistent medical problems such as anemia, thyroid disorder, and other stuff like that. Um, there's also frequent hospitalizations, uh, nocturia, so they wake up multiple times in the middle of the night to go urinate, frequent awakenings. Uh, CSA patients also have apneas which are observed by their bed partners. They often, often do not snore, so that's a thing to notice, and they frequently are not aware that they have arousals. CSA is more common among thin males with heart failure who are older than 65 years of age and have AFib or other arrhythmias. And they also have daytime hypocapnia with CO2 levels less than 38. Some other symptoms may include paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, headaches, and nocturnal angina. So let's talk about screening patients in cardiology clinics. So there's multiple scenarios where we can get this done. Uh, patients with reduced ejection fractions who have symptoms of sleep disturbance, such as fatigue or frequent awakenings new heart failure consults, patients in clinic following a heart failure related hospitalization, atrial fibrillation patients prior to their ablation procedures, patients have newly diagnosed AFib, cardiac device patients who have documented ICD shocks or arrhythmias, particularly during the nighttime hours, and CRT non-responders seen in the clinic. So there's multiple scenarios. Um, I recommend anyone that has AFib or heart failure and are symptomatic, it should be screened and tested. So let's identify patients who need testing. So you wanna assess for the symptoms for sleep apnea. So they have fatigue and or daytime sleepiness. They have nighttime awakenings for any reason. They've observed apneas by their bed partners or neighbors. Uh, nocturia, so they wake up in the middle of the night and urinate. There's also a questionnaire, the stop bank questionnaire, which we'll go over in the next slide. 
which can assess for risk factors and symptoms of sleep apnea. Currently, there's not a questionnaire for CSA. So to stop bang is an easy questionnaire. Each letter stands for something. So S stands for snoring. T stands for tired, fatigued, or sleepiness. O stands for observed apneas. P stands for a history of high blood pressure. B stands for a body mass index greater than 35. A stands for age greater than 50. N stands for a neck size greater than 16 inches. And G stands for gender for male. So each letter stands for one point. And low risk is zero to two. Intermediate risk is three to four. And high risk is five to eight. This is a really easy questionnaire. It's the fifth grade reading level. The sensitivity is 93% for moderate sleep apnea. The specificity of 43% for moderate sleep apnea. It is validated in the preoperative setting. However, this may miss some cardiac patients with sleep apnea. And we do recommend that patients with three or more that scored um, yes responses should have a sleep study. So let's talk about ordering sleep studies. So there's two types, the home sleep study and the PSG or the polysomnogram. The PSG is the in-lab study, um, which is the most accurate. So it looks at many different things. Um, the EEG, which is a brain waves, so you can see what stage of sleep patients are in, if they go into deep sleep or REM sleep, looking at your snoring, respiratory effort, heart rate and heart rhythm, if the patient kicks their legs or grinds their teeth. There's also a video, so it tells us if the patient does anything crazy um, while they're sleeping. The home sleep study um, can also tell uh, sometimes between CSA and OSA. You want to make sure that it has and measures the chest movement, oxygen levels, and airflow. There's also newer technology, the PAT signal, which is the peripheral arterial tone signal, which is also seen in the NMR uh, watch pad devices. And some cardiovascular patients may meet clinical criteria to start with a polysomnogram, but these decisions typically depend on what the patient prefers, if the sleep lab has openings, because a lot of times they're kind of booked up, and insurance, um, because they make all the rules these days. Uh, and in terms of ordering sleep study, the provider can order sleep study directly, or they can refer to sleep medicine, and they can evaluate the patient from scratch. I also do advise that the sleep specialist uh, be boarded in sleep medicine to ensure higher quality care. So let's look at this study. So sleep disorder breathing is a predictor of mortality in heart failure patients. So they looked at um, patients hospitalized with acute heart failure who have left uh, ejection fraction less than 45% who were not already diagnosed with sleep disorder breathing. They underwent a sleep study and were followed for three years. And essentially they found that heart failure combined with CSA is associated with a twofold increased risk in death. And this is the largest study to date to evaluate the effect of sleep disorder breathing on post-discharge mortality in patients with acute heart failure. So I thought that was pretty interesting. The next study shows central sleep apnea increases the risk of heart failure readmission. So they looked at heart failure readmissions within six months, the CSA population versus patients free of sleep disorder breathing. And essentially they found that 50% of heart failure patients with CSA were readmitted to the hospital at six months. And over 25% of heart failure patients with CSA had two or more hospital readmissions within six months. So I think this is important that we can identify patients at risk for negative outcomes following a heart failure episode. So these patients can be targeted and treated to positively affect the post-discharge outcome in patients that have heart failure episodes. So let's talk about the limited treatment options for central sleep apnea. So the first one, CPAP, or continuous positive airway pressure, is the most common. Essentially, the patient wears a mask, which is provided or connected to the machine, which provides continuous air to keep your airway open and treat the obstruction in your airway. Um, there are some clinical trials that have demonstrated improvement in the AHI and the ejection fraction. There was a trial called the CANPAP, which we'll go over in detail later, but that showed no improvement in quality of life or morbidity and mortality and was stopped early for safety. Um, the CPAP does not currently have an FDA approved indication to treat CSA. And some of the reasons why CPAP may have caused you know, um, safety issues um, is due to the increased thoracic pressure that results from applying CPAP. So that causes adverse effects on the preload 
and afterload of both the right and left ventricles, which may arise, and therefore ultimately, you know, cause and worsen cardiac function rather than improving it. Another PAP machine is called ASV or adaptive seroventilation. So essentially that provides still a continuous positive air pressure like the CPAP, but it's also equipped with sensors that can detect central apneas and deliver several breaths at a tidal volume and respiratory rate that was previously determined to match the patient's minute ventilation during their breathing. And the goal is to prevent an increase in carbon dioxide levels during the apnea and the hyperventilation that follows, therefore breaking the, you know, the periodic breathing cycle. Um, so typically ASV is actually a little bit more better uh, tolerated by patients. Uh, however, studies have shown that there's improved, improvement in AHI, but no improvement in quality of life. There was a trial, the serve HF trial, which we'll go over in a little bit later as well, that showed that there was an increased cardiovascular mortality in patients with an EF less than 45%. So um, this is a black box warning. So, you know, there's, there's a, some debate about this in the sleep medicine world. Uh, but typically right now, if patients have EFs less than 45%, patients are typically, and doctors are provided or trying to avoid prescribing ASV to these patients to avoid potential cardiovascular mortality. Number three is uh, oxygen therapy. So um, there's some randomized studies that have shown improvement in AHI, but no improvements in arousals or daytime sleepiness. Again, it does not have an FDA approved indication to treat CSA. Another thing to know is that it is not possible to reduce the upper airway obstruction that which we can also accompany CSA as well. And in my experience, we've also had issues getting that covered by insurance. And number four are medications. So thiophylline and acetazolamide. Both were studied in short, less than three months studies with less than 20 patients. Again, they don't have FDA approved indications to treat CSA and they're typically not that effective. Um, and they have to be careful about the side effects too because thiophylline can cause arrhythmias and or shock as well. So positive airway pressure devices such as CPAP or ASV are frequently prescribed for CSA despite limited effectiveness data as we described earlier as well as compliance and tolerance issues. So they've been shown to reduce the AHI, but have not been shown to improve improvements in arousals, REM sleep, which is a deep sleep, or quality of life in the randomized clinical trial. And many patients are unable to tolerate it due to multiple reasons. So the mask is uncomfortable, uh, it's causing some irritation on the face, it's causing some redness or marks on the nose or indents in their face. A lot of times the mask leaks, so Patients have to, you know, swap out multiple masks to find the one that fits them the best. And um, sometimes the insurance companies don't cover masks every so much, every often. So that's an issue. Uh, pressure intolerance, so they can't tolerate the higher pressure if they are required. Uh, skin irritation, nasal congestion, or nasal dry mouth or mouth dryness. Nosebleeds you can also get. Patients are also claustrophobic, so they don't like something on their face. Or sometimes they pull off the mask in the middle of the night without them knowing can also disrupt the bed partner and challenge to intimacy. It's not the sexy thing to do. Uh, 25 to 50% of patients refuse or are unable to tolerate these therapies, which is a pretty high number, given that it is the first line therapy typically. And 40 to 60% of patients are non-compliant to even a minimal bar of four hours per night or five nights per week. And that's a CMS rule um, for patients to be able to keep their machine per insurance. Uh, randomized clinical trials have also revealed safety concerns for PAP therapies in patients with um, lower EFs as well. So uh, positive area pressure therapies have failed to meet their clinical endpoints. So these are the two trials we talked about earlier. So on the left, we have the CAMPAP. So they looked at patients um, using CPAP for the treatment of CSA in heart failure patients. And this, it was stopped early due to increased mortality in a treatment group and slow enrollment. And they postulated that, so essentially it did not demonstrate any effect on their primary endpoint, which is transplant-free survival. And they postulated that the reason why this happened was because there was poor patient compliance with CPAP therapy, which after one year was only being used for about 3.6 hours per night. Another issue was that in a trial, CPAP therapy may have not adequately treated the CSA in 43% of patients. So that's something to consider. And on the right, we have the serve HF trial. So essentially they looked at patients who have heart failure 
with an EF less than 45%, and they were treating them with ASV. And so the primary endpoint uh, was you know, not met in that uh, both all cause and cardiovascular mortality were both increased with this therapy. And so the authors possibly, the one reason was that central sleep apnea may actually be compensatory or beneficial for a mechanism in patients with heart failure. And the other issue is that uh, positive airway pressure may actually impair cardiac function in at least some patients with heart failure. But regardless, both trials showed that they did not meet their clinical endpoints. So now let's talk about remedy system therapy. So it's a transvenous phrenic nerve stimulation with the remedy system. It's fully implantable with the indication to treat moderate to severe central sleep apnea in adults. And it received FDA approval in October, 2017. It stabilizes breathing by activating the diaphragm to generate negative pressure in the chest similar to one's natural breathing. It turns on automatically at night. So ensures there's nightly compliance with the patients and adherence over time. And the device is silent and does not require the patient to wear a mask or to use a remote. It's implanted by a cardiac electrophysiologist or EP. And there's two or three major parts. So the pulse generator, which is implanted below the clavicle, a stimulation lead, which can also sense, um, which is placed either in the left pericardiophrenic or the right brachiocephalic vein. And a sensing lead, which is placed in the zygous vein and helps optimize therapy, which is also optional. So this is a brief statement by Remedy, which we'll go over in detail later. So this is what it looks like. So this is the pulse generator on the right, a stimulation lead, and a sensing lead. It's typically placed on the right, and it can be implanted with patients that do have a cardiac device, such as a pacemaker or a defibrillator. So which patients are appropriate for Remedy? So it's indicated for treatment for moderate to severe central sleep apnea in adult patients. It is contraindicated for patients with an active infection or patients known to require an MRI. And per the pivotal trial, which we go over into later detail later, the inclusion criteria are moderate to severe CSA and AHI, which is the number of times you stop breathing, at least 20 events per hour or more. Central apneas, at least 50% of all noted apneas, and at least 30 central sleep apneas uh, noted throughout the study. Obstructive apneas have to be less than or equal to 20% of total AHI. So that's mostly central, not obstructive in nature. So the therapy activates automatically each night and it's delivered when these three parameters are met. It's programmed within the patient's sleeping hours. So we set the hour when they wanna to go to bed and when they wanna wake up. And the patient is reclined past the program sleeping angle and the patient is not moving. Therapy is paused when the patient sits up or the patient moves, and it resumes a few minutes after the patient returns to a reclined position and is once again still. So this is a really good picture showing about how Remini provides stabilization of the breathing and apnea events are significantly reduced when phrenic nerve stimulation is being delivered. So on the left, you can see a patient with central sleep apnea. So as we talked about earlier, um, there's no effort, no airflow, everything's flat, oxygen levels are dropping. And therapy's off. On the right, when we put therapy on, all these are resolved. Um, there's effort, oxygen level stabilized. It's perfect. So what is the recommended programming and follow-up? So after the device is implanted, we wait for the patient to heal, typically one month, and then they come to the office to have it activated with the respiratory rep being present. Then for the next one to three months, we have the patient acclimate and customized therapy to find the settings that are appropriate for the patient that they feel the most comfortable and has the patient sleeping the best. And at that point, when we think we are at the right settings, we typically order a sleep study in the lab uh, to see what the objective AHI is, if you need to make any more setting adjustments, and we may change some adjustments during the sleep study as well. Following that, if everything looks good, we typically do programming checks every three to six months to optimize therapy. And they may, we may order serial sleep studies down the line as well. And the remedy system provides diagnostic reports which provide information for programming. So it looks at therapy timing and sleeping posture, activity trends, therapy duration, if they're napping or what they're doing in the afternoon and capture index by position. So now let's go over some clinical results. 
So to demonstrate safety and efficacy and to gain FDA approval, Respicardia has evaluated phrenic nerve stimulation for treatment of CSA in 275 plus patients across multiple trials. So as you can see here, the number of subjects were listed and there's multiple trials, but by far the largest trial was the pivotal trial, which is the largest randomized trial and it did meet all its endpoints and showed benefit. But regardless, all chronic studies have shown consistent improvements in sleep metrics and quality of life. So this is a schematic showing consistent AHI reduction with their phrenic nerve stimulation across multiple studies. So as you can see, all the p-values were all significant and the difference in means ranged from like 19 to 36, but it worked in all the studies across the board. So now let's go over the pivotal trial. So this was a prospective multi-center multi randomized control trial. The baseline criteria, which we talked about earlier, was moderate to severe CSA based on a PSG scored by a blinded core laboratory. AHI is greater than or equal to 20. The C central apnea index was at least 50% of all apneas with at least 30 central apnea events. And the obstructive apnea index was less than or equal to 20% of the total AHI. In terms of the endpoints, the primary endpoint was a reduction of 50% or more in the AHI between the treatment and control. They also looked at the safety, so freedom from serious adverse events associated with the implant, remedy the system, or the deliver therapy. And they also looked at secondary hierarchical um, endpoints such as central apnea index, the AHI, arousal index, REM or rapid eye movement, patient global assessment scores, oxygen desaturation index, and the upward sleepiness scale. So the upward sleepiness scale is a measure of certain situations that your chance for the dozing off and fall on the sleep. The highest score is 24. Anything above 10 is considered significant. So in terms of the demographics, they're pretty comparable from the treatment compared to the control. So average age was about 65 or so, and most of them were male, which was commonly seen in patients with CSA. They're overweight or obese, so BMI around 30 or more. Their ejection fractions were about in the 40s, and all of them having heart failure about in the 60 percentile range. 40 percentile range typically had atrial fibrillation or another cardiac device. The AHI was in the 40s, and the central apnea index was in the 30s, so moderate to severe. And the upper sleepiness scale was around 10 or so, which is considered significant. So. In the pivotal randomized controlled trial, the remedy system demonstrated clinically meaningful improvements in sleep, sleep apnea, and quality of life. So in regards to all the endpoints we discussed earlier, all of them were met, and all the values were significant. So I think that's pretty impressive showing that this therapy works. So in regards to reduction AHI, central apnea index, um, the arousals, percent of sleep in REM, quality of life, um, oxygen desaturation index, and upward sleep in NISCO. So they also looked at patients 24 months after therapy and in-lab studies showing that there was effective and durable results with a sustained AHI improvement and almost no central apneas. So you can see on the left, around the central apnea index is around 30, which is you know severe. But two years later with remedy therapy, it went down to like 0.2. That's really good. Um, but there are some residual obstructive events as you can see here. But in terms of central, those are mostly treated. So the remedy system also resulted in significant improvements in quality of life and other symptoms after six months of treatment. So the upward sleepiness scale improved, which demonstrated clinically significant improvement in daytime sleepiness. So around three, three and a half percentage points went up, uh, sorry, went down with the, uh, with the remedy system. Um, in terms of 79% of patients had an improvement in quality of life with the remedy system. And about 60% actually showed a marked or moderate improvement. And 95% of the patients reported that they would elect to have the medical procedure again. So this is their willingness to repeat their procedure because they're feeling so well and sleeping so well. The remedy system also demonstrated a strong safety profile. So 91% were free from serious adverse events associated with the implant procedure, the remedy system, or the delivery therapy at 12 months. All related serious adverse events resolved with any, without any long-term sequelae. There were no deaths related to their procedure system or therapy. And there's a 97% implant success rate, including 42% of subjects that had already had another cardiac device. 
some typical adverse events that may occur are leave dislodgement, pocket erosion, and or implant site infection, just to be aware. But they're very low in percentile range. Uh, there is some new data that came out looking at sustained improvement um, with the remedy system five years later. So we talked about on the left, you can see the central apnea index is you know, much decreased at baseline, sorry, at one year, two years, three years, and now five years later. So the five years data showed that the AHI decreased by a median of 24 events per hour. Similarly, the central apnea index reduced by 24 events per hour, the median, and the upward sleepiness scale decreased significantly from a medium of 11 to a baseline to four. And this is all five years down the line. So this shows that it sustained improvement with the remedy therapy five years later. So in conclusion, central sleep apnea contributes to a harmful progressive cycle of hypoxia, arousal, and sympathetic activation. There have been few treatments for central sleep apnea and little randomized data demonstrating efficacy. Phrenic nerve stimulation offers a safe and effective therapeutic option for treatment for CSA with improvements in both sleep and quality of life. And so for more information, you can contact our office at 302-990-3300, ask for Amanda. You can also go to our website, tidalhealth.org. Respicardia has also some really good information on their websites, respicardia.com or respicardia.com slash clinic slash clinician slash study hyphen results slash. And with that, I'd like to thank Tidal Health and Respicardia for sponsoring this event. And now we'll take some questions. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal, for an excellent presentation. Um, as a reminder to everyone, we're going to uh, go into questions now. There is a Q&A button, again, at the bottom of the screen for most of you, potentially at the top of the screen for others. Um, I would also like to introduce Dr. Robin Germany, who will be joining us for the Q&A. Uh, Dr. Germany is the CMO or Chief Medical Officer of Respicardia. She is also a Clinical Assistant Professor at the University of Oklahoma and is dual trained in heart failure and electrophysiology. So thank you for joining us for this segment as well, Dr. Germany. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me join you this evening. Perfect, so, so the first question, um, and I will direct this to you, Dr. Agarwal, is do you have to try CPAP or BiPAP in order to be eligible for uh, the remedy system? Uh, no, you do not, but for my patients, I go over all the treatment options for CSA, which we talked about earlier, but from my understanding, you do not have to. Okay. And can you talk a little bit about when you offer remedy in your treatment pathway? At what, at what point it's introduced and uh, considered by the patients and, and yourself? So I inform the patients about all the therapeutic options. So I go over, um, you know, CPAP, BiPAP, ASV, um, oral appliance, surgeries, weight loss, remedy therapy, um, even um, maximum deeper advancement surgery for obstructive. Um, but for CSA specifically, I typically recommend, or if the patient is willing to try path therapy first, um, it's up to them um, and see how that goes. If not, I usually push a remedy if, there's, if they meet the criteria like we discussed earlier, um, but it all depends on the patient, but I try to educate them about everything. Okay. Uh, and the next question is, can someone with, um, Oh, so can someone with residual obstructive sleep apnea, um, if they are treated with the remedy, can they use other treatments afterwards? So sorry, let me rephrase that. So for someone that's treated with the remedy system, but also has an obstructive component to their apnea, do you use any treatments afterwards or are they eligible for other treatments? Yeah, so like we talked about on the slides, um, there might be some residual obstructive events, which may not be treated with remedy therapy. So I think those patients um, can try CPAP or an oral appliance or positional therapy so that both the obstructive and central events are being treated. Great. Then, uh, the next question I know you touched on a little bit, but can you uh, give a couple more details on the difference between remedy and inspire? So remedy is indicated for moderate to severe central sleep apnea, um, and it's also implanted by electrophysiologists. Inspire is indicated for moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, and that's implanted by an ear, nose, and throat physician. So there are different devices treating different things. Inspire also does require a remote before you go to bed, you press on. Um, but both are really good therapy options for both obstructive and central sleep apnea. 
Uh, either yourself or Dr. Germany, just explaining a little bit of the mechanism of how they work as well. Dr. Germany, maybe do you want to lead off with that one? Sure. So, so hypoglossal nerve stimulation is going to stimulate the, uh, the nerve that actually um, innervates the tongue. It's going to move that tongue forward and, and open the airway um, in patients with obstructive sleep apnea. In, in central sleep apnea, patients basically stop breathing. So phrenic nerve stimulation is going to stimulate um, one uh, phrenic nerve to stimulate the diaphragm to move that and restore a natural, natural breathing. It's a really different mechanism of action. Okay, thanks. Uh, we've got another question about eligibility, Dr. Agarwal. Can patients have the remedy system as well as another cardiac device, pacemaker, IV, et cetera? Yes, that's not a contraindication. And a lot of patients do, like 42% of patients in the pivotal trial actually did have another device, so. Perfect, thank you. Um, a question for Dr. Germany is, is it easy to change the time settings of the device? Uh, for example, daylight savings time, going on vacations, et cetera. Uh, how, how is that done? Sure, great question. Yeah, the, the device is programmed uh, using a, a tablet computer in the office and you can pre-program that change um, so that it'll change automatically um, on the day that daylight savings time changes or when they go on a trip and it can automatically change back um, at the appropriate time and day. Perfect. Um, an another question, uh, maybe Dr. Jeremy will let you start and Dr. Edgar will add, add to it. Are, um, are, is the remedy system easily co covered by insurance or do patients typically have, have to go through CPAP or ASB first? Easily is always a, a good question with insurance, right? Um, so, so the remedy system has uh, been well covered by payers so far, about 85% of prior authorizations. I think we're up to almost 90% now um, in the appropriate patients um, do uh, get through that. Some of our, the insurers would prefer that patients um, have either tried or are not candidates for a non-invasive therapies um, prior to implantation of the device that they've tried at least one um, option or refuse that option. So they, they couldn't tolerate CPAP, for example, because they're claustrophobic um, before that. Um, Dr. Argo, I'd be interested to hear your experience with your own patients. Yeah, I mean, I had pretty good luck and then covered um, for both Medicare, Medicaid, and even commercial insurance. Um, I will say that I would advise, uh, this is just for me, but I document very well, like the, if they try PAP therapy, what their central apnea index, if they have chain stokes respiration, because the more that we have documented, I think that'll help with getting coverage better as well. Perfect. And uh, so Dr. Agrawal, you mentioned compliance challenges with PAP therapy. Uh, are there any compliance challenges with remedy that you've seen in your patients? Uh, no, because it turns on by itself. You don't have to wear anything. So, <laughs> um, it turns on every night. So as soon as you go to bed and lie down or, uh, it turns on and activates by itself. And then you program it when you want to wake up. So it should be nightly compliance. Um, so that shouldn't really be an issue. Okay. Uh, another question for you. So uh, some of the stop band criteria that you mentioned, um, for example, BMI, neck size, uh, male gender are, are not typical for central apnea patients. Have you ever considered making any adjustments uh, for cardiac patients to ensure CSA patients um, are identified? And I guess along with that, are any of the other screening tools like the ESS um, used for, for these patients? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think right now in the sleep world, there isn't really a good screening questionnaire for CSA. So I think a lot of it, you have to look at their past medical history, uh, what their symptoms are, and as we talked about, some of the symptoms for heart failure and or AFib may overlap with sleep apnea as well. Um, but I would say like if they have AFib and or heart failure and they're symptomatic, whether they're having daytime sleepiness, uh, some snoring, disruptive sleep, how we get them screened and tested. Great, thank you. Uh, okay, a couple more questions uh, for Dr. Agrawal, well, or Dr. Germany. Um, 
Is there a min age or max age for the device? And then how long does the battery last? Uh, well, Dr. Jeremy, why not I let you take those? Because I imagine you have deep familiarity. So from, a, from an FDA standpoint, over the age of 18, um, I think, you know, ages is different for different people. Um, we have implanted patients in their 90s, um, but obviously very active um, patients that um, really were symptomatic. Um, and then the other one was about battery life. Overall, the battery life is about four years, um, but this is a neurostimulator. So it depends a little bit on the needs of the patient um, and, and where those leads are placed and how much energy is needed. So, but on average, about four years. Okay, and a uh, question for Dr. Agarwal. I think this is just in your experience. Are these are these remedy patients um, common? How many patients do you have on remedy? I currently have five. Um, so, but I'm always looking. I just referred a patient um, to them actually two weeks ago on the same day. <laughs> um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not as common as a, as a structured sleep apnea, but like I always educate patients about remedy therapy. Um, the trial, um, as we talked about, is really showing sustained improvement, symptomatic improvement. Patients are tolerant it and they're willing to repeat their procedure again. So I think something that we should offer our patients to everyone. Okay. And a question for Dr. Germany. Uh, some of the, so Dr. Agarwal noted some, um, there were some serious adverse events uh, reported during the trial. Could you give any more detail as to what type of events those were and, and what the long-term outcomes were? Certainly. So with any invasive procedure, there's going to be some serious adverse events. They're very similar to pacemaker or defibrillator. So many of these patients already have experience with those devices. Um, but those serious adverse events included things like um, infection. There were two of those, one at the beginning of the trial, one at the end. Um, the, a lead can move, it's um, unusual, but it can move about one to 3% of the time or need to be repositioned. Um, but importantly, none of the serious adverse events that were mentioned um, caused any long-term harm to the patient, all resolved prior to the end of the trial. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then we're getting towards the end of the question. So if anyone does have more, to type them in now, but uh, the other one that there was one, to... there's one. Oh, you have one. Okay. Oh, well, uh, so I was going to ask about uh, there's a question about patients that have primarily central apnea with obstructive events more than 20%. Uh, so, Dr. Eggwald, did you want to talk to that one? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, as long as they have moderate to severe central sleep apnea, that's number one. Obstructive, the thing is, they might not treat. The obstructive as well with the remedy because remedy is targeting only central. So then you may need, if they put remedy in, it may treat the centrals, but then you might, how are you treating the obstructive? So then you might need to have some other therapy on top of that. I don't know if Robin, you want to add to that? Yeah, so it is compatible with other therapies. So um, we've talked about, we, we've successfully used positional therapy in a few patients, um, especially those that just have um, uh, obstructive, residual obstructive events on their back. Um, it can be used with CPAP. We actually uh, have a half dozen patients um, that have been placed on, on that. And then there's been talk about using a dental appliance, but I don't have any clinical data on that yet. Um, so, so I'd be interested if anybody else has had experience with that. Perfect. And I think that brings us to the end of our question. So I wanted to say thank you to uh, Dr. Germany and of course, Dr. Agarwal for an excellent presentation today. Uh, we had a great size to our group and uh, appreciate everyone who joined us and asked questions. And, and thank you again for such a great presentation, Dr. Agarwal. Thank you. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you and everyone have a good night.